What I want to do today is talk about work that we are interested in right now. But I want to phrase it a little bit in terms not only of work in progress, but also in terms of sort of how to approach science or what we what we have what I at least believe we need to think about in approaching science. So um, what I want to first do is give you my perspective on how synaptic parameters control neural circuits. It's a pretty long introduction. I will then talk about neurexins and briefly introduce them because there may be some people here who haven't heard about them yet. But when you walk out of here, except if you walk out now, you will always <laughs> remember, okay? And then finally, I will tell you two stories, two sort of bits of the overall Nurexin story that is very much in progress. I want to sort of, as a very beginning, because this is an institute that is dedicated to trying to promote the understanding of autism, that what I'm going to tell you will not be very useful for the understanding of autism. I don't know much about autism. And I'm basically a neuroscientist who works on synapses. I'm trying to understand how synapses <coughs> work. And I feel that that likely may have a positive effect on the understanding of autism, of some, some forms of autism. <coughs> but there is no direct relationship of what I'm going to talk about today to any particular disease. So let's start with the first topic, which is, as I mentioned, something of an extended introduction. As you know, in neuroscience nowadays, the central point at which sort of that, or the central concept that keeps neuroscientists talk to each other and that holds the, the divergent communities of neuroscience together is the notion that the neural circuit is sort of the minimal element of the brain that allows us to understand how it might work. Neural circuits are neurons connected by synapses. And it is, I think, fair to say that neural circuits are formed by synapses and that the synapses represent the central elements of not only information transfer between neurons in the circuit, but also the fundamental element of information processing. There are three synaptic parameters that dictate the input-output properties of circuits. First of all, and this is really important, although we don't understand it, synapses are formed at specific sites. They're not only formed between specific neurons, as shown here in this simple cortical circuit, feedforward inhibition circuit, but they're also formed at specific sites within these neurons. There are different pre- versus postsynaptic neuron types and different localizations. Synapse properties differ dramatically depending on the identity of the pre- and postsynaptic neurons. The release probability, a presynaptic property, differs depending on the postsynaptic neuron, the kinetics of release, postsynaptic receptor composition, and so on. Arguably, the most important property that differs between synapses is plasticity. And there's many different forms of plasticity. There's short-term plasticity, there's long-term plasticity, and it dramatically differs between types of synapses, as shown here in an uh, illustration that I lifted from a paper by Wade Regeer, demonstrating two different types of short-term plasticity on Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. We don't know how the identity and the properties of synapses is determined. But it seems likely that transsynaptic interactions between the neurons at the synapse, mediated by synaptic cell adhesion molecules, contribute to shape these parameters. And by shaping these parameters, shape 
the overall properties of circuits. However, despite the importance of circuits and synapses within circuits, it is unclear how we can actually understand circuits. And the current standard approach is a top-down approach. And it basically consists of three elements that are often combined two or three at a time. And these are, first of all, connectomics, to map connections using, for example, viral traces, cholera toxin, et cetera. The second is to determine which neurons and connections participate in a particular behavior. The classical experiments would be optogenetically excite or silence particular populations of neurons and then look at behaviors. And the third one is to do in vivo recordings in awake behaving animals, usually rodents, measure spike patterns of neurons during a behavior. And it's clear that the information, the vast amount of information that has been emerging from these approaches has been enormously interesting and helpful. However, these approaches are not without concerns. Okay? One is that there's a lot of circuits, a lot of neurons, and a lot of behaviors to describe. We all picked our favorite behavior. But the fact is that the behavioral repertoire, even of an animal, and the interpretation of such behaviors is enormous. And the interpretation is difficult. And it's not an easy thing to approach. The second concern, in my view, is that these analyses actually do not explain a behavior. They're purely correlative at best. The fact that a behavior changes when a neuron fires does not mean that that neuron mediates that behavior. Okay. Especially since in these paradigms, you usually don't deal with few neurons. You usually deal with many neurons at a given time that are unlikely to be activated or silenced altogether in a natural situation. So I think that these types of approaches, I would argue, I would plead that these types of approaches need to be complemented by other approaches. The most important concern, however, for me, at least conceptually, is that these approaches assume that neurons are the minimal computational unit of the brain. That in other words, the spike patterns of neurons is sort of the information that allows you to eventually understand how the brain works. But a neuron spike patterns are not by themselves, the neuron spike pattern is not by itself informative because we just don't know how such patterns are translated into a postsynaptic signal at its effluent synapses. The spike patterns do not actually illuminate the computational role of a neuron in the brain. It's really the output of a spike pattern, not just the spike patterns. That is important. And I would like, this is for me the most important point in this, so I would like to illustrate this with an example from our own lab that sort of, I hope, makes clear what I'm trying to talk about here. So this study started some years ago when we looked at what happens to a particular behavior, fear memories, fear conditioning, when you inactivate the prefrontal cortex. And specifically, what we did in these experiments is inject AAVs into the prefrontal cortex, AAVs that inactivate neurotransmitter release. And we used two different procedures. I won't go into the details. They both impair synaptic transmission. And then we asked what the effect of such manipulations is on fear conditioning. Now, as many of you know, the prefrontal cortex is not supposed to have an effect on fear conditioning. And so Wei Shu, who did these experiments, did these by expanding the traditional paradigm and adding a further test of fear conditioning. What usually happens is that you first train an animal by pairing a shock with an environment and an auditory cue, and then you test whether the mouse resembles, they re remembers the context you, to test contextual fear conditioning, and afterwards you add the sound, and, you remember, and that does acute fear conditioning. We added as a further step 
a test of the mouse in an altered context that resembled this one but was changed to measure whether the mouse could actually remember that it was a different context and whether it remembered it too well or not well enough. And so these are the results. As expected, contextual fear conditioning was unchanged by inactivating prefrontal neuron output. Cute fear conditioning was also unchanged. But in the altered context, the mice couldn't quite realize that it was an altered context. Whereas the control clearly didn't freeze as a measure of fear conditioning memory compared to the control, co uh, compared to the training context, or compared to the uh, to the contextual of acute fear conditioning, the alt the uh, manipulated mice basically froze more, and this indicated to us that the prefrontal cortex in some way controls the precision, if you want, of the memory, the how well the re mouse recognizes that the context is altered. And so we wondered, how does this work? What are the pa ta pathways that mediate that? And so we used the technology that we call SynaptoTag to map connections out of the prefrontal cortex. We found the usual suspects thalamus, for example, striatum, and so on. But we also found that a major target was a midline nucleus called the nucleus reunions. We then tested these various target regions using the same inactivation approach for their involvement in this memory precision paradigm. <coughs> and found no involvement of the striatum, for example, but a dramatic involvement of the nucleus reunions. To further analyze this, we both inhibited the output of the nucleus reunions using tetanus toxin, one of the two procedures that was used in the previous slides, and we activated the activity of the nucleus reunions using a knockdown of a cell adhesion molecule that's specific for inhibitory synaptic transmission. And doing this procedure, we found, again, as always, that the training contextual fear conditioning wasn't changed, but that the altered context was dramatically, as before, with in, uh, uh, abolishing transmission the mouse thought it was in the same context with activating transmission. It thought it was in a different context. Fear tone is not changed, and the discrimination index is calculated from these data by, by basic to determine, by dividing it through the others, by determine, to determine how, as a way of illustrating how well the mouse can discriminate altered from real context. So this suggests to us that there is a pathway from the prefrontal cortex over the nucleus reunions, which is known to project to the hippocampus, that basically contributes in some manner to the control of, fear memory, of precision of fear memory. So we wondered, well, OK, this is fine, but is it just how much this nucleus fires, or is there a pattern to this? Is it actually the spike pattern, or is it the spike number, if you want? And so we used an optogenetic approach. And this optogenetic approach involved expressing channel rhodopsin, chief in our case, in the nucleus reunions, and then stimulating the, all of these neurons in the nucleus reunions, and probably some around it as well, with two paradigms of stimulation either a 4 hertz tonic stimulation or a phasic stimulation. So 15 pulses, 30 hertz, silence, then boom, silence. Okay. Two very different stimulations <coughs> that both stimulate, significantly stimulate the nucleus reunion. We then afterwards did the context test and the outer consonant tone test to examine which of these manipulations had an effect on memory precision. And what we found was, as always, contextual memory was unchanged, but that in the altered context, 
The phasic and the tonic stimulations, it's better illustrated in this discrimination index, had opposite effects. So suggesting that it wasn't actually the activity of the nucleus that is really <coughs> the matter here. What is really the matter here is the information is in the pattern <coughs> of stimulation. And the acute uh, field conditioning was the same. So this indicated to us that just stimulating <coughs> this particular nucleus will have a behavioral output that is dramatically different depending on what exactly the stimulation pattern is. And in other words, that the nucleus reunion spike patterns control fear memory precision not via global activity, but via the temporal distribution of that activity, which is translated in different signals at its efferent synapses. So we cannot actually understand, possibly understand, how this might work if we don't actually know how different patterns, spike patterns, translate into different postsynaptic signals at various efferent signals. And in other words, synapses and not neurons are the minimal computational unit of information processing. And so if we want to understand how circuits operate, we will need to understand, I believe, not just connectomics, how they're connected, or what effects potential manipulations have, or what the spike firing patterns are of these neurons. We will have to understand also the properties of the afferent synapses. How can we possibly do that? So there's many different ways how you could imagine doing this. One is to try to actually determine the properties of individual synapses one by one. There's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> it's quite a few synapses in a way. Um, another one is to operate with the notion, the idea, that the properties of synapses are the results of molecular determinants, that they are basically shaped by genes, molecules, which imp confer onto synapses these properties. And that if we understand those genes, molecules, then we can potentially understand the properties of synapses without measuring individually one. And this shaping by molecules is what I call the molecular logic of neural circuits, with the idea being that there is a molecular machinery that determines synapse connectivity, synapse properties, plasticity, a molecular machinery that we do not know at this point. Okay. And this is really what sort of constitutes, if you want, the program that we would like to pursue or that we would like to contribute to. Because I think that if we can actually get at these molecules and understand how they operate and how they interact with each other, we can then understand better how circuits are built and what circuit patterns mean and what firing patterns mean. And one of the key determinants clearly of such a molecular logic will obviously, I think, be synaptic cell adhesion molecules which connect the pre- and post-synaptic site and contribute to the properties of synapses. And this is the background for the work that I'm going to talk to you about in the rest of this talk. Neurexins are central contributors, we believe, to this molecular logic that I want to talk about. And so let me introduce you to neurexins. Let me tell you what neurexins are, and let's start at the beginning. This is a black widow spider. And fortunately, I've never seen one, actually. <laughs> I've only seen pictures. <laughs> so. <laughs> We, I suppose we, some of us at least fantasize about black widow spiders in other contexts. But anyway, um, so we were interested in black widow spiders not because of social behaviors or uh, mating rituals. We were interested in black widow spiders because they make a toxin called latotoxin, 
that binds to presynaptic terminals and elicits massive neurotransmitter release. And many years ago, we set out to purify and clone the receptor for that toxin. And when we cloned the receptors for that toxin, we found that they constituted a family of cell surface proteins that we named neurexins more than 20 years ago, I'm afraid to say. It's been a long time. Um, we named them neurexins because we felt that that name would sort of illustrate that there are neuronal proteins on the surface and wouldn't mean anything in terms of function because we had no idea what the function is. So um, we cloned these proteins. We found that they are cell surface proteins that are expressed in a bewildering number of splice forms. They're highly polymorphic. And that they have domains that are homologous to domains found in extracellular matrix receptors and extracellular matrix interacting proteins. And because of this, because of the polymorphic structure of neurexins, the new localization to synapses and their sequence similarities, we speculated that they may be in some way involved in imparting onto neurons a certain identity, that they serve as, in part at least, as what I called at that time a recognition molecule in the nerve terminal. This prediction took actually a long time to test and validate. But I think it is now safe to say that neurexins are indeed cell surface molecules at the synapse that tell the synapse how to behave, if you want. Neurexins are illustrated here schematically in this slide on the presynaptic side. They come in two flavors, alpha neurexins and beta neurexins. The beta neurexins are transcribed from an internal promoter of the alpha neurexin genes and are almost identical to alpha neurexins. They have a short specific sequence and then splice into the last LNS domain of which the B alpha neurexins have six. In addition, the alpha neurexins have several EGF-like sequences. There are three genes of neurex for neurexins in vertebrates, each with two promoters for alpha and beta neurexins. There's broke alternative splicing at six sites. There's thousands of isoforms, as we have recently confirmed using PAC biosequencing. They bind to intracellular PZ domain proteins, especially CASC, which we cloned because it binds to neurexins. And there have been many, many mutations, I think hundreds of mutations now, associated with autism and schizophrenia. Neurexins are clearly synaptic, although it took a while to clarify this. What this slide shows is an immunolabeling of synapses in cultured neurons from mice in which neurexin 1 was labeled with a knock-in mice with an epitope tag, demonstrating that it is co-localized with a presynaptic marker piccolo and adjacent to the postsynaptic marker homer. Neurexins are likely functionally important. Initially, when we started working on neurexins after we cloned them, we made knockouts. But because there's alpha and beta neurexins, we focused initially on the alpha neurexins. And this was during a time when there was no conditional technology. So all these knockouts initially were made as constitutive knockouts. And we found that the single alpha neurexin knockouts were viable, but they were not normal. The double alpha neurexin knockouts largely died at birth, and the triple neurexin alpha knockout, alpha neurexin knockout mice all died. It was very difficult to work with these animals because already the single neurexin knockouts had a phenotype because they didn't breed well and because it was extremely hard to actually work with them as non-conditional knockouts. However, the limited analysis we did at that time demonstrated that there was no significant loss of excitatory synapses, but a massive block of synaptic transmission in these knockouts. And just to illustrate this in one slide, what you see here is the key data from a paper we published more than 10 years ago, demonstrating that in cultured cortical slices, 
electrophysiological recordings using this four pulse stimulus paradigm revealed that the triple knockout compared to the single neurexin to alpha knockout in order to get littermates, you can imagine how hard that is, was actually a massive impairment in the amplitude of the response and a massive increase in the failure rate. A typical and classical presynaptic phenotype demonstrating that the alpha neurexins were essential for the normal function of these synapses. Further studies demonstrated that there were many changes, a whole lot of them. Massive loss of presynaptic neurotransmitter release, calcium channels were dysfunctional either because they weren't there or because they were not active, and, and, and. But we were at a dead end because obviously these things were very important, but the way the mice were constructed made it impossible to really analyze the precise functions, which is only now occurring due to the generation of conditional knockouts. So what these experiments demonstrated thus is that the neurexins are functionally important and that they're important for synapses. When you look at that, it seems obvious given together with this baroque alternative splicing, that they must do some organizational role and that their organizational role must be in some way regulated. The best way that could be regulated would be by this alternative splicing. If this alternative splicing was indeed regulatory, you would expect the alternative splicing to be regulated. This indeed is the case the best studied alternative site of alternative splicing in neurexins is a splice site called number four. Very imaginative name because it's the fourth one. And that alternative splice site, just at the level of crude brain regions, is highly regulated across the brain. What you see here are the results of mRNA quantifications using quantitative RT-PCR. Different brain regions, total levels of the three neurexins in these different brain regions are relatively similar, although they differ up to twofold. However, if you look at the ratio of splice site in versus splice site out, for splice site number four, you can see that there are vast differences. So here, splice site out is most prevalent, especially for neurexin three in the cerebral cortex, whereas in the adjacent striatum, the splice site in is favored almost tenfold over splice site out. So there is a dramatic regional difference. And this doesn't take into account that each of these regions is composed of many different types of neurons that may have differences in alternative splicing themselves. So it gives you an idea about the degree of regulation that occurs at this site of alternative splicing. So neurexins perform a fundamental essential function in synapses, and this function may be regulated by alternative splicing. And obviously, when you look at the structure, it seems clear that there must be some postsynaptic interaction partner. And over the years, we and others have identified many such postsynaptic interaction partners. In fact, there is almost too many by now, and there is more coming, suggesting that neurexins anchor a whole network of transsynaptic interactions. I am illustrating on this slide only four of these interaction partners all of which bind to presynaptic neurexins with nanomolar affinity. Neuroligands were the first interaction partners that we identified, actually exactly 20 years ago, and that bind to both alpha and beta neurexin. Cell balans were recently identified by the Machina lab to be high affinity interactors for neurexins. LRTMs, we and Anna van Gosch's lab identified, and serolatophilins, whose localization is not quite clear, also binds to neurexins with high affinity. What unites these four different interaction partners is not only that they bind to neurexins with nanomolar affinity, but also that all of these partners here are in fact regulated by alternative splicing at splice at number four. But they're regulated by it in different ways. For example, cell balance only bite if there's an insert in the splice. 
there's no insert, there's no binding. Conversely, LRTMs only bind if there's no insert. So in this case, then, alternative splicing at this site in your accents is a switch between cell balance and LRTMs if they were the only postsynaptic ligands expressed. Neural ligands bind to neurexins also in a manner regulated by alternative splicing at this site, but this is a little more complicated because neural ligands themselves are alternatively spliced, and the alternative splicing of neural ligands dictates their relative affinities for different forms of splice at number four. So what emerges from these studies and many others that I don't have time to talk to you about today is something of an interaction network, uh, what I would call a dynamic interaction network, whereby the pre- to post-synaptic interactions that are centered around neurexins in this case are dynamically dependent on which ligands are expressed, at what concentrations, and which splice variants of these ligands and of the neurexins are expressed. And that creates a situation whereby there will not just be one readout, one particular receptor ligand pair, but there will be the possibility of diversity depending on these regulatory events. Finally, especially important given that I'm here, mutations in your accents and their ligands have been linked to autism and schizophrenia. And I mentioned this already for your accents. There's many, many cases now it's almost exclusively neurexin 1-alpha, although there's other neurexins implicated as well. And in fact, it is at this point, I believe, still the most frequent single gene mutation that's been associated with schizophrenia, although it is rare. Neural ligands were repeatedly found to be mutated in autism. LRTMs have been shown to be linked to schizophrenia. Shanks at least according to Thomas Bougeron, are the most frequently single gene mutations in autism. I don't know if it's true. And CASC and their interactors have also been linked to mental retardation and various neuropsychiatric disorders. Interestingly, sometimes even in siblings with the same mutations, the clinical presentations differ. So it's clear that these mutations in these various genes do not just simply produce one form of autism. They contribute, often with very high penetrance, at a very rare event um, to the development. But other factors obviously play a role. Okay, so much for my introduction for neurexins. I hope it is clear from this introduction that neurexins are likely to be central players in a molecular network that has the potential to do a lot of different things. And I will not make any attempt in this presentation to try to tell you what neurexins do, because, well, I would love to make that attempt, in fact. <laughs> I just don't know. Okay, so I'm not gonna tell you that. Instead, what I wanna do for the remainder of this talk is tell you two stories one a little bit longer, the other one very short, that basically illustrates facets of this new action function and just also takes into account the meaning of the diversity of new action isoforms. And so I first want to talk about beta new actions in a study that we are still engaged in and that is unpublished but that amazed me, and that's why I like to talk about it, okay? Because I prefer to talk about stuff <laughs> that still amazes me. Um, so, the question here that was pr pr asked in this particular study is, why do all neurexin genes produce beta neurexins if alpha neurexins alone seem to be so important? And that question was particularly poignant because in quantitative studies, we found that beta neurexins are expressed actually at very low levels compared to alpha neurexins. So they are minor form. And so we actually found this out only after we had started to make knockouts for beta neurexins. Otherwise, we would probably never have made the knockouts because we would have thought 
that the beta neurexins are just sort of accidental transcription units. But to ask this question, we made knockouts of the beta neurexins, and we made conditional knockout of the beta neurexins, targeting on their first exon that is specific for beta neurexins and not shared by alpha neurexins. And we validated that in these conditional knockouts, alpha neurexins are expressed normally. And what we found when we analyzed these mice in cultured hippocampal neurons is that administration of Cree recombinase, which deletes the beta neurexins, compared to a delta Cree condition, which is a mutant of Cree recombinase that is catalytically inactive and thus the control, there was a dramatic impairment in many frequency, as you can see here. However, there was only a small change in many amplitude, and there was no change in MIPFCs. We were surprised by the magnitude of this phenotype, because this, for many frequency, is quite a lot. And so we wondered if this change reflects a general decrease in excitatory synaptic strength. So we measured AMPA receptor and NMDA receptor mediated evoked postsynaptic currents, EPSCs, as well as GABA receptor mediated IPSCs. And you can see that both NMDA and AMPA receptor mediated EPSCs were similarly decreased in amplitude, whereas there was no change in GABA. So this is a typical signature of a presynaptic release phenotype, although it could be postsynaptic. It's a typical signature of a presynaptic release phenotype because both receptor types are equally affected. Indeed, we found that this phenotype is due to a decrease in release probability using other procedures that I don't have time to discuss without changes in the radio releasable pool of vesicles or synapse numbers. We then wondered whether this phenotype is due to impaired calcium influx. And we developed a method of testing this in cultured hippocampal neurons where we express initially GCAMP5, G fused to synaptic breath, and now GCAMP6. That targets it to the presynaptic terminals. And you can see it's targeted to the presynaptic terminals. And if you stimulate this, it comes up. And then you can actually look at synapses that are specifically on spines, because these are most likely excitatory synapses. And you can quantify the GCAMP signal compared to the m cherry signal that is in sparsely transfected neurons in the same culture and gives you a very robust signal. And this allowed us to test specifically what the effect of the mutation is on presynaptic calcium influx. What you see here is a typical sample traces. These are the data. This is the stimulation numbers as a function, uh, the calcium amplitude as a function of stimulation number. And this is the final sort of summary. And so what we observed was a clear decrease in calcium influx as a function of the deletion of beta neurexins with main, continuum maintenance of alpha neurexins. Now, this seemed very interesting to us because the alpha neurexins were still expressed. So whatever was happening must be very specific and very selective. And so we wondered if this is a specific phenotype. And in order to test this, we performed rescue experiments. And we rescued these neurons with either neurexin 1 beta containing or lacking a splice site 4. And what you see here is that the rescue was very clear cut. Cree decreases the mini frequency. It can be fully rescued only with the SS4 minus, but not with the SS4 plus, suggesting that the beta neurexin effect is due to an action that requires the extracellular alternative that is, extracellular, that is dependent on the alternative splicing of the extracellular domain of neurexin of beta neurexins. So what is the mechanism of this phenotype? The decrease in release probability in calcium influx to us suggested, because this is the signature of such effects, of an endocannabinoid effect. As you all know, endocannabinoids are central 
regulators of, or not central, they're regulators of synaptic strength in a very broad sense. And although they've been around for more than 10 years, I think only recently has the extent of their functions in the brain become more and more apparent. They're diffusible signaling molecules. They're produced postsynaptically, diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to presynaptic CB1 receptors, the GPCR, to inhibit neurotransmitter release by impairing action potential triggered calcium influx. So we tested whether the decrease in, in these knockout synapses, of release in these knockout synapses, could be due to an increased endocannabinoid tone, endocannabinoid signal. And we did this by adding a CB1 receptor blocker. And what you see here is that the CB1 receptor blocker has no effect on the uh, mini frequency in the control neurons, delta Cre, but that it increases the mini frequency dramatically, and this can be summarized here in the knockout. So clearly, there's an increased endocannabinoid tone that is produced by the knockout of the beta neurexins, which to us was surprising, suggesting that the phenotype may be due to an increased endocannabinoid signaling. So what we have shown you up to now is that triple <coughs> conditional knockout of beta neurexins and cultural cortical neurons causes suppression of presynaptic release probability by decreasing presynaptic calcium influx ex excitatory synapses, that the beta neurexin knockout phenotype is rescued only with neurexin 1 beta lacking but not containing a splice at 4, and that the beta neurexin knockout phenotype is reversed by blocking endocannabinoid CB1 receptors. And so this led us to the hypothesis that the beta neurexin knockout <coughs> decreases release by increasing endocannabinoid signaling. Now, all of this was done in vitro in cultured neurons. And for those of you who are neuroscientists, there's a lot of justified has hesitation in the field about cultured neurons. They're great reduced system, but they're not, some people say they're not even real neurons, but they're certainly not the same thing as what happens in the brain. So we wanted to test this hypothesis further in vivo. And to do this, we chose a preparation that we have increasingly been using because it beautifully allows you to test, to manipulate presynaptic uh, uh, terminals in vivo. And this preparation is to inject stereotactically, in this case at P21, into the CA1 region, AAVs, that express either delta Cre, the control, or Cre. And then to cut slices from these two weeks later, two to three weeks later, and to record from these slices by patching subiculum neurons, which represent the major output pathway for the CA1 pyramidal neurons. And the beauty of this preparation is that no subiculum neurons are actually infected. So they are entirely postsynaptic, but not manipulated. Whereas only the presynaptic neurons that send the axons here to the subiculum are manipulated. The problem of this preparation, if it is a problem, which I don't, is, however, that the Pyramidal neurons in the subiculum contain two predominant types, and they are very, very different. One type is called regular firing because upon depolarization, they fire action potentials in a pattern that the people who first observed this thought to be regular. The other one is burst firing because upon depolarization, they fire bursts of action potentials. And these two types of neurons have different properties that distinguish them from each other. Most importantly, they have different types of long-term plasticity in that the regular firing neurons have an NMDA receptor-dependent form of LTP that is induced postsynaptically, whereas the burst firing neurons have an NMDA receptor independent form of LTP that is thought to be induced presynaptically. So dramatically, they have totally different forms of long-term plasticity. 
does this preparation allow for an analysis of specifically presynaptic effects on synaptic strength and on synaptic plasticity, and the two different types of plasticity sort of control each other. What we found when we analyzed the regular firing and burst firing subiculum neurons from the beta neurons and knockouts was that in the regular firing neurons, there was a trend towards less synaptic strength as shown here, this input-output curve, but it wasn't significant. Whereas in the burst firing neurons, there was a dramatic decrease in synaptic strength, similar to the cultured hippocampal neurons, suggesting that we have a similar phenotype. We then wondered whether that decrease is due to an endocannabinoid-dependent signaling effect. In order to test this, however, we had to figure out whether endocannabinoids play any role in these types of neurons in excitatory synaptic transmission, which had never been characterized before. So we had to first analyze this. When we used AM251, which blocks CB1 receptors for endocannabinoids, we, when we added it during recordings, low frequency stimulation, we found that the regular firing neurons showed no change in synaptic strength, suggesting that the CB1 receptor was not activated at all, whereas the burst firing neurons increased in synaptic strength, as summarized here and it's better here. The effect was small, but highly significant, 20%, suggesting that there was a small amount of endocannabinoid tone specifically on the burst firing neurons. So what is the relation of this to beta neurexin knockout phenotype? Remember, the burst firing neurons were also the ones that were preferentially decreased in the beta neurexin knockout. So we took the burst firing neurons from the beta neurexin knockouts and we added AM251 and we found, as shown here, that the control went up again, just as I showed you before, about 20% or so, but the knockout went up much further, and this is summarized again here, compared to 100%, which is the starting point, demonstrating that the decrease that we observed in synaptic strength is indeed, at least in part, due to increased endocannabinoid tone, in other words, that at this particular synapse in vivo, the same effect is observed as in vitro and cultured neurons in that the beta neurexin knockout activates the endocannabinoid tone. How does that relate to LTP, if at all? Now remember that the burst firing neurons have an NMD receptor independent presynaptic LTP different from the regular firing neurons. We looked at the effect of the knockout on both types of LTP. And we found that on regular firing and in the receptor dependent LTP, there was no effect whatsoever. So it's perfectly normal. But in the burst firing form of burst firing neurons, the beta neurexin knockout blocked LTP. This is for all intents and purposes a block. Is this phenotype related again to endocannabinoids? It is. What you see here is AM251 on control neurons in the burst firing neurons has no effect on LTP, robust LTP. You see it here in the knockout, it rescues LTP. It now goes back up. So in other words, the lo loss of LTP in this case, which is presynaptic LTP, is due to, a to an increased endocannabinoid tone that acts presynaptically to interfere, presumably, with a presynaptic LTP induction uh, mechanism. And so the way we think about this is that the endocannabinoid production postsynaptically is regulated specifically by beta neurexins. It's suppressed, at least in those hippocampal synapses that I told you about here. And that when this is relieved, this inhibition, then CB1 receptors get activated and release goes down and LTP goes down. This provides at least one facet of what beta neurexins might do at a synapse and provides a potential 
rationale why there are beta interactions at all. Although the generality as well as the mechanism of this pathway remains unclear. Now, the obvious question at this point is, does this mechanism have any behavioral implication? Is this sort of dysregulation actually trivial, or does it have some, at least some behavioral implication? And as you know, we are looking here at the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is the obvious place to look for contextual fear conditioning, because the hippocampus is sort of contextual fear conditioning that I introduced to you earlier, is sort of the standard hippocampus-dependent behavior. So we looked at contextual fear conditioning as a function of this CA1 inactivation of beta neurexins. And what we found is that contextual fear conditioning was indeed impaired. Altered context wasn't impaired. Cued fear conditioning wasn't impaired either. It was just the contextual fear conditioning, suggesting that the information output from the hippocampus to the subiculum that must be important for contextual fear conditioning is impaired by the change in synaptic strength on, and the change in LTP, either one, on the burst firing postsynaptic neurons in the subiculum in this paradigm. In other words, presynaptic beta neurexin not going to impair contextual fear conditioning probably by changing the pattern of output dependent on the presynaptic firing pattern. Uh, note that this impairment that I'm now talking about reflects the classical role of the hippocampus in contextual memory and very different from the nucleus reunion stuff I talked about in the beginning, which is a completely different subject. So, implications. Beta neurexins perform non-redundant functions not mediated by more abundant alpha neurexins, which was a surprise for us. Presynaptic beta neurexins reg regulate postsynaptic endocannabinoid synthesis and or secretion. And so this is a form, what I call transsynaptic synapse specification, because presynaptic beta neurexins, in a splice site dependent manner, instruct the postsynaptic production of endocannabinoids. And postsynaptic endocannabinoids control presynaptic LTP in a manner dependent on beta neurexins, which to us at least was informative because endocannabinoids had not been implicated in presynaptic LTP in the subiculum or for that matter anywhere else. In the last few minutes, we're getting to the end here, um, I want to tell you about a second story and I promise it will be shorter. Okay. So maybe there's still some cookies outside. Um, so, and this story, again, relates to alternative splicing. It's actually something we published, but it is sort of complementary to what I just told you, which is why I want to talk about it now in closing. And the overall question here is very different. The overall question here is, what is the physiological significance of alternative splicing of neurexins at splice set number four? And in this question, since there's three new accents, and we couldn't deal with all three at the same time, we chose to deal with only one new accent, new accent three, which has the most dramatic regulation that I showed you in this whole brain analysis earlier. And so this alternative splicing, as you know, regulates a lot of interactions. The approach we took was a genetic approach. <coughs> I believe in genetics. And this approach involved taking the alternatively spliced exon, which is exon 20 in the neurexin 3 gene, and then by homologous recombination, changing the splice acceptor sequence, which is very non-canonical here, into a canonical perfect splice acceptor sequence, with the idea that the non-canonical splice acceptor sequence mediates the alternative splicing, and that if this splice site except the sequence was canonical, this would always be spliced in and would no longer be alternatively spliced. In addition, we flanked the axon with LOX P sites to take it out. And so the idea here was that the Norkin should cause constitutive inclusion of splice site number four, whereas the Cree recombinase should cause constitutive exclusion because it removes it. In other words, in this Norkin, no recombinase is always splice set four in. Recombinase is always splice set four out. This actually works, which is terrific. 
And so we have shown that this 100% inclusion of SPICET4 with the NORCAN, 100% exclusion obviously with the NOC, with the removal, which is uh, straightforward. When we analyze these neurons again in cultured neurons as shown here, we observed an unexpected phenotype, completely unexpected for us. And that was that the AMPA receptor EPSCs were decreased significantly, but the NMDA receptor <coughs> EPSCs were not. Neither were the IPSCs. Now this difference here means it can't be a presynaptic phenotype because if there was a change in release, there should be equivocal changes in AMPA and NMDA receptor dependent responses. This smelled like a postsynaptic phenotype. And this was rescued by all neurexin isoforms as long as they were SS4 minus, not if they were SS4 plus. Since this suggested a loss of postsynaptic AMPA receptors, we visualized the AMPA receptors using aminocytic chemistry. This is surface staining of AMPA receptors followed by permeabilization and then staining for the postsynaptic marker PSD95 and the presynaptic marker VGLUT1. And what we found is that the density of puncta, of synapses, was unchanged. But that there was a loss of the postsynaptic accumulation of both GLUA1 and GLUA2 types of AMPA receptors, suggesting indeed that there was a loss of postsynaptic AMPA receptors upon a constitutive knock-in of SPICET4 in your exon 3 that was reversed when you took it out <coughs> with query recombinase. This phenotype, it turns out, is due to increased endocytosis of AMPA receptors. They are destabilized. And when we got this result, we were confused because it's a, pre it's a postsynaptic phenotype, very classical, but neurexins are supposed to be presynaptic. So we wondered whether neurexins really act presynaptically. And so we used the same subiculum preparation that I introduced to you earlier to specifically only manipulate presynaptic neurons and then test the effect on postsynaptic responses. And what we found is that now different from what I told you about the beta neurexin knockout, there was a similar impairment of synaptic amperoceptor mediated postsynaptic responses, synaptic strength, in both regular firing and burst firing neurons that was reversed by presynaptic excision of splicet number four, which converts it into splicet four minus, and which is the same as the wild type control. Actually, there's even an overshoot here. Demonstrating <coughs> that in both types of postsynaptic cells, the presynaptic neurexin autoptive splicing regulated the postsynaptic content of AMPA receptors. These studies obviously lead us again to ask what about LTP? Because as you know, LTP involves, among others, when it's postsynaptically induced, a change in amper receptor trafficking. And so we also ask about what happens in with LTP here. And remember that the subiculum has these two different forms of LTP and two different types of neurons. So we first tested again the regular type of LTP. And we found that with the NMDA receptor dependent regular type of LTP, LTP was now gone. It could be rescued by cre excision of the splicing form. So presynaptic alternative splicing of neurexin 3 dictated postsynaptic LTP. And this result is counterintuitive because you would imagine that if you have less AMPA receptors, the Triggered insertion of AMPA receptors during LTP should, if anything, be increased. It should not be decreased. And it indicates that the presynaptic signal that is mediated by the neurexin involves a postsynaptic effect, signaling effect that goes beyond simply regulating the steady state of AMPA receptors. What about the presynaptic form of LTP? It is perfectly normal, very different from the beta neurexin. So 
we have two different manipulations in this particular preparation of neurexins, conditional manipulations, presynaptic manipulations, that affect differentially two different types of LCP. Sort of illustrating the, fast, the diversity of functions that can be regulated or affected by these presynaptic molecules. The implications are that neurexin autonomous splicing, first of all, is physiologically significant. For us, that was a big deal because the whole neurexin story started with the emphasis of an alternative splicing. It means something, at least at this site. Alternative splicing mediates synapse specification. It's again a process of synapse specification where one molecule tells a synapse <coughs> with one particular property how to behave. The presynaptic signal is required for post RTP, and this transsynaptic neurexin action involves signaling by binding to postsynaptic ligands. I haven't shown you the data, but it is most likely actually LRTMs that are involved, which bind only to SS4 minus, and that mediate this effect. <coughs> so in closing, I told you it would be short. So in closing, let me sort of put this into some kind of uh, overview here. So what I showed you in our previous work is that alpha neurexins are Non have non-redundant functions in a broad sense in many different component aspects of synaptic transmission. A general organization of the presynaptic term terminals, pretty much all parameters we looked at at this time, at the previous time. Whereas the beta neurexins, the non-redundant functions, were limited to synaptic strength at excitatory synapses and presynaptic LTP at least in the limited number of synapses that we analyzed. And finally, arterial splicing of neurexin-3, the one redundant function of regulation of postsynaptic amperoceptors and NLA receptor dependent LTP. All of these manipulations, even those alpha neurexin knockouts, depend, affect only a subset of neurexins. We now know that if we knock out alphas plus beta from a single gene, the phenotype is much more severe than the alpha neurexin knockout alone. So what you see here are just what is non-redundant. There is likely to be many additional functions, non-overlapping functions, that hopefully will emerge as we go on. And so the single unifying theme of all these observations is that neurexins are sort of organizers that enable a synapse to function and instruct the synapse based on their expression patterns and alternative splicing in terms of its properties. And that they do this likely by diverse interactions using diverse mechanisms. In other words, various neurexin isoforms are modular effectors that specify synapse properties via competing ligand interactions. And in this manner, neurexins contribute to the molecular logic that builds synapses and neural circuits. And it's easy to at least to imagine without really being able to pinpoint anything specific that changes, even small changes in some of these synapse specifications would have dramatic effects on information processing or some information processing properties of the brain. So in closing, I first try to convince you that we need to have a broad view in the understanding of neural circuits that goes beyond just stimulating neurons and recording spike patterns. I've then tried to make neurexins unforgettable for you. And I hope I've succeeded. I'll test you all tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and in most of my talk, I've told you about two facets that we are currently most interested in and that illustrate our approach to try to unravel the diverse functions of these molecules. And many people contributed to these studies. Garrett Anderson did the beta neurexin work largely together with Katsuhiko Tabuchi and help of others on the slide. And Jason Aoto did the splice at four work I am very happy to have many collaborators who I really enjoy working with. 
Bob Malenka is my neighbor at Stanford. Lou Chen is my other neighbor and my wife. Uh, Steve Quake is next door. Marius Wernick, with whom we work on human neurons that I haven't discussed today, is upstairs. And Axel is a structural biologist who's also next door. And especially important funding, NIMH has supported me together with the Hughes on all of these studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any ideas about what cell type specific splicing factors might control the isoform expression that you see? It's a very important biological question which we have not worked on. There were a couple of papers from Israel, from uh, CISAPL, that first characterized these splicing factors. And more recently, a Scheifele paper confirmed some of these studies. So there's a couple of groups that work on that. Well, it's hard to ask questions about something so broad as your beautiful presentation. But I might have missed this. But did, do you have any evidence that neurexins are excluded from particular synapses, that they're only in a subset of synapses, so, or just ubiquitous? So it's acting, again, I'm sorry. Yeah, I probably went over this too quickly, as always. So. Um, it seems to us, as far as we can tell, that neurexins are expressed in every neuron, absolutely every neuron, including gut neurons. And that multiple neurexins are co-expressed at different levels. We have recently started to perform single-cell RNA-seq studies. And neurexins are among the most abundantly expressed mRNAs. So it's safe to s suppose, although we don't have any evidence for that, that they're made in all neurons and actually present in all synapses. Could I just follow up on that? Are, are neurexins only in the brain, or are they expressed in other parts? Oh, so that is a, in our hands, neurexins are specific for neurons in the brain and the peripheral system. Although there may be low levels in the kidney, in the Glomerular apparatus, I have no idea what it does there, yeah. as well as, as in some neuroendocrine systems. The levels are much lower, and I don't know what the, whether they have a function there. However, there are papers that claim that they can see neurexins absolutely everywhere. And although I'm generally very happy about people who see my molecules everywhere, I <laughs> I'm not sure that that's actually true, because as you all know, you can see any molecule by RT-PCR in any cell if you just do enough cycles. So, I mean, yeah. So do you know when, during synapse formation, norexins appear? Are they early in the gathering of proteins that form a synapse? Or is this a late insertion into no the synapse? I have no idea. The mRNAs occur very early. In fact, that was initially used as one of the arguments that neurexins can't be involved in synapses because they appear so early until people figured out that every synaptic gene is transcribed so early. So all synaptic genes are described long before synapses actually occur. I don't know about proteins. It's a good question, and we would actually like to follow that up now that we have better reagents. Yeah. I was wondering if you have evidence for dynamic regulation of the splicing, and also if um, a single axon, one thing's on the postsynaptic side, but on the presynaptic side, would a single axon making multiple contacts with different neurons all have the same splice variant? Yeah, so the first question, it's really not our work, but others have shown that there is dynamic regulation by stimulation, um, and we have not repeated this, so I, I, mean, I assume it's so true. Um, the second question, I don't know. I simply don't know. You would need splice-side specific antibodies, which we don't have. Yeah. I, I really don't know. Yeah, I was just wondering if the norexin uh, alpha and beta complex or form dimers, if you know if that happens. Do they dimerize with each other? I mm -hmm. don't know, but biochemically, there's no evidence for dimerization. Mm -hmm. None whatsoever. 
I'm a transplant surgeon, so you probably have little interest uh, in Quite what I'm doing since I'm only transplanting completely denervated organs. There would be bad models for what you're doing. But I have a more general question. I read a quote uh, of your, and perhaps it was inaccurately rendered. Pardon me if it's not completely true, but my understanding is you had voiced some concerns from a more general perspective that there was an overemphasis on translational aspects of research and of science nowadays. But sitting in your, uh, listening to the interesting presentation, you have alluded obviously several times to clinical uh, neurologic diseases and so on. So is this a fluid uh, border between too much or too little translational, or you where know, do you stand on that? Can I get your name and telephone number? <laughs> okay. Uh, this is really, if you call what I do a translational, I, my funding will increase dramatically. <laughs> it's uh, wonderful. Yes. Yeah. You see, the word translational research is a word that some of us are trying to push towards the type of work I presented. And I truly believe that it is translational in the sense that I strongly believe that we need to understand diseases in order to be able to translate the knowledge that we derive about them into therapy. What I object to, and I explained this to the students also at the, at the uh, lunch today, is the strong emphasis of translating research right now into cures. The strong pressure of performing clinical trials when there is really no information on which to base clinical trials, which in the autism field, in my view, has happened repeatedly. And I think that that is wrong because it costs money and it sends the wrong signal because when the trials fail, it looks like the science on autism in general is bad. And it's not in general bad, it's just premature. So I think that I, I'm, I'm actually convinced, I mean, I'm after all, I was trained as a doctor, although I got out for the benefit of the patients, but nevertheless, okay, <laughs> I am very motivated to understand diseases because I think that that's the prerequisite for treating them. But I am strongly opposed to the push of trying to study diseases directly and trying to learn simply by studying diseases without understanding the underlying biology because without understanding that, we're not gonna make progress. And I stand by my quote, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so I uh, mean, nice talk, definitely, and very, I'm convinced, I mean, New York City is very important, I mean, so we are now, I mean, we know the synapse better. But uh, you mentioned earlier that, I mean, currently there are a lot of work on the mapping study, but I mean, I, th I think it's definitely, I mean, your, your work, I mean, it's kind of, combination because like it seems later if we want to understand the behavior we like to mapping I mean given a context like now maybe most studies just mapping the white type of, uh, animal but later we want my need to mapping like white type and the con connecting def defeating knockout or some mutated in the different isoforms so it's kind of a more more work so it's a like, shortcut like to to can understand this <laughs> yeah so actually, I mean, your work is increased the work, work, you know, but not reduced. <laughs> I don't think, so uh, let me sort of uh, respond in, at several levels here. Um, I think that mapping, the approaches that I mentioned in the beginning are absolutely essential and useful. What I object to is the implication that they will explain <coughs> behavior, for example. I think that that is not the case, and that very often we read to nowadays in papers that a certain behavioral output that is induced, let's say, by silencing or stimulating a particular neuron or class of neuron, that, that these neurons do that behavior. Okay. So in my example, the new nucleus reunions does not do memory precision. It is involved in that pathway. And what I find interesting about that study, what fascinates me most is the prefrontal cortex because it really suggests the controlling function of the prefrontal cortex in that particular behavioral output. But it doesn't tell us how the behavior arises. Okay. Now, 
accusing me of making things complicated is, first of all, not very uh, polite. <laughs> 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 but I also think, actually, it's not even right, because I'm trying to, one of the things I try to communicate is that I think that in biology, just like in physics, we need to understand first principles. And I believe those first principles will be molecular. And I think that if we deconstruct the molecular components, there will be first principles emerging that then will reduce the complexity of how the brain is organized. So I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's the working hypothesis. So there are um, a couple of uh, uh, postsynaptic binding partners of Nurexin. So you mentioned a few. And uh, what determines uh, which uh, partner to bind? That's yeah. my first question. And second one is, in a diseased state, mm -hmm. any of this uh, binding uh, impaired or enhanced? Those are excellent questions. The first question, I our working hypothesis based on pure in vitro data is that you put your finger actually on a very important part of what I'm trying to say, which is that what I call a dynamic interaction network, which is the idea that if you have multiple binding partners that compete but affect different signals because they otherwise have no sequence homology, that the interaction will win that has the highest affinity and where the binding partner is at the highest concentration. So that means that in terms of affinity, it's the alternative splicing and isoforms. In terms of the concentration, it's gene transcription. That will determine it. And my working hypothesis is, since many of these genes are co-expressed in the same neurons, is that there is some degree of competition and diversity. So sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both, depending on the ratios and so on. That is all theoretical. To actually show that is a different matter, but that's as good as I can do it. Um, in to, uh, with regards to disease states, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that changes, when I mean, just try purely theoretical, changes in these molecules are likely to affect information processing, obviously. And in fact, we have studied this at different model systems. So one is we have studied neuroligan mutations extensively, as I discussed with Jackie Crawley this morning, um, <coughs> to try to see how mutations in neuroligans that in themselves don't seem to have much of a phenotype can selectively affect certain behaviors and how, which synapses, which brain regions and so on, so that we can actually get down to the more nitty gritty stuff. Um, so I do think that it's plausible, I mean, it's easy to imagine how small changes that may not actually change synapse function so much could still selectively affect certain behaviors. You know, one thing about autism and schizophrenia is that the brains of the affected individuals work actually extremely well. It's not that, I mean, they are, they are I mean, I'm not trying to belittle the disease, but these people are, can do most brain functions perfectly well. So it is a very selective change in some brain function, whereas others work perfectly well. It's not a total loss of something. It's, it's really a selective change. So that fits much better with a change in subsets of synapses and subsets of circuits as opposed to a global change. What I found uh, quite remarkable is that the neurexin manipulations lead to this increase in basal endocannabinoid signaling. Um, it somehow reminds me of what's happening in fragile X mental retardation, where you actually actually have this constitutive uh, switch on of MQR dependent signaling that leads to more or less constitutive LTD and suppression of transmission. So, have you thought about any connections here, and if our neurexins have neurexin mutations at all implica been implicated in um, fra fragile X. Um, well, I guess there's a fragile X, but um, have there been any links? Speculative. I, I just don't know. Yeah, My wife works on fragile X, so 
I don't want to step on our toes, that's for sure. <laughs> I don't want to go home at night. <laughs> uh, thank you for this excellent talk. Um, I, I want to touch a little bit upon what you just said earlier. So, neurexins, splice variants of neurexins are cell types specifically expressed or circuit specifically expressed. And I wonder whether this information could be used in combination with the loss of function mutations that have been identified in schizophrenia and autism to dissect the circuits that underlie either pathology. We are trying to do that, yeah. yeah. So we have done this at least for one behavior and one neuroligand mutation. We're trying to do that, yes. There are so some interesting similarities as well, yeah. So be similarities between the schizophrenia and autism? Well, there's interesting in the sense, so, um, that there is some overlap of the behavioral effects in mice between neurexin mutations and neuroligan mutations. And let me just say that I don't think that in these mouse models we should look for behavioral effects that resemble the human disease because these are diseases of the human mind and the underlying changes in the biology may manifest very differently in mice. So it's not the specific behavior. It's more the circuit-dependent behavioral change that I'm interested in. And given that, that's exactly what we're trying to do. That's one of the major goals of, my, of the research program that we're doing right now. Yeah. We're doing exactly that, yeah. If I can follow up, you think that's an effective approach? Do you think that's going to work? Well, I think, you know, I hope. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> the UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.